I'm a passionate woman, and I'm a woman with depth and with desire. For me, OM has been more about surrender, helped me open my orgasm. Confidence and clarity. It's like connecting to that like sexual and powerful women inside. The story is about a company called One Taste, that is a sexual wellness company that teaches a practice called orgasmic meditation. When it feels that good, you don't want to move an inch. Everyone should be experiencing this and talking about this part of our lives. This was the food I was searching for, you know, and that I didn't have a name for, and they were calling it orgasm. How did they say it? It's like orgasm is God. Desire is the force on this planet meant to grow us into the person that we know we can be. It's just so incredible and I really genuinely want everybody to have access. It just felt so understandable to me how they could take those first steps toward something that ended up in a place that was really predatory and maybe even a cult. My name is Ellen Hewitt. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg, and I wrote the story, The Dark Side of the Orgasmic Meditation Company. One Taste has several different philosophies that kind of guide what it does. They first and foremost believe that doing the orgasmic meditation practice, which is a 15-minute partnered clitoris stroking practice, helps open up your connection to um, your body, your desire, to other people. Basically, it just does many, many good things for you. And they see it as a practice that should be taught alongside um, meditation and yoga. OM is a partnered practice where the upper left-hand quadrant of a woman's clitoris is stroked lightly and deliberately for 15 minutes. Some of the benefits of OM include feeling confident and self-expressed, increased vitality, learning to use desire as your guide, better sex, and deeper relationships. You know, some people just take a few classes and some people it becomes their life. And I think for those in the group where it really takes over their life, some people love it and some people feel like it's the worst thing they've done. I spent a long time talking with, she's named as Michal in the story, that's just her first name. She struck me as someone who was just really relatable, she was in her late 20s when she joined. She had been a teacher in New York, and she had recently gotten out of a relationship. She was feeling a little low and thinking to herself, maybe I need to meet some new people, make a change in my life. And she encountered One Taste the way that many people do, uh, which is through one of their free events. Hi! <laughs> Ia, of course, I wish you would back up, is in our desire room. You would show up, and it's a bunch of people, and maybe you do something like play communication games. I'm about to write down some desires and put them on the wall. Yeah, we're just gonna paper the walls. With and everything. she leaves with this impression that these people are really, like they've figured something out. And they continued to get in touch with her and they said, hey, you know, if you wanna learn more about orgasmic meditation, maybe you should take our intro to OM class. And this is a class where you, um, you know, they talk about the philosophy of one taste, they teach you about orgasmic meditation. Um, they, have a demo in which the two teachers demonstrate um, one ohm session in front of the class. So how we'll do it is I'll describe what's gonna happen and then I'll bring in two people to do the demonstration for you. And then at the end of the day's class, they would let students pair up if they wanted and try orgasmic meditation for the first time. So that's what she did. And after that, you know, they just kind of kept getting in touch with her, and it happens gradually and then all at once. Like she got closer with these people, she left her job to come start working for One Taste, and she moved out of her home to move into an ohm house, as they called it, in New York. I don't think there are very many places in the world where we can feel a full range of emotions, even to their highest intensity, and not have to shut them down in one way or another. I've had people describe orgasm to me as a force 
almost like the force from Star Wars. So people would talk about how like, you know, listen to your orgasm, like what is it telling you? And like, is it telling you to do this or that? And they would rely on people who were very advanced in one taste to help them understand um, how they should be sort of following their orgasm. Hi everyone. So my name is Maya. I have been oming for eight years now. I was in the class and I remember this experience of feeling like I was having questions answered that I didn't even know I had the question of. The people I talked to who got involved seemed really similar to myself. They just seemed really normal, right? These are people, and I felt that there was something pretty universally human about what they wanted. They were looking for community, meaning. They wanted to belong to a group of people who felt like they were working all together towards something really special and important. For a while, it was very popular within the group to believe that if you were having sex with a lot of people, that you would um, free yourself from the things that uh, constrained you in terms of how you related to other people. And they often talked about how preferences were something that would hold you back. And this meant that you gained sort of more spiritual enlightenment if you had sex with or did sexual acts um, that you didn't want to. It taught members to ignore their personal boundaries um, about what they did and didn't want to do. Ultimately, OM is a practice. So you don't need to be turned on or in the mood to do it. In fact, OM cultivates libido. And so Michal starts taking more classes. You know, these classes are very expensive. They can cost anywhere from several hundred dollars um, to some of them are thousands of dollars for a retreat. And you can pay $60,000 for a year-long membership, which lets you take any of the classes you want. So quickly, um, she started spending more and more money. Um, it kind of leads into this larger teaching that One Taste had, which was that money is just sort of an emotional obstacle to getting what you want. Going into debt to pay for courses was really common. This was actually something that salespeople at One Taste would encourage students and customers to do. They would say, oh, if you really want this course, you'll, you know, you'll find a way to pay for it. Look, you could even open a new credit card. There was a woman who I was, I was, I was dating, and she said, hey, um, I want to take this class with you, and I want you to pay for it. And I was like, what? And we hung up the phone, and I just sat in this chair, and I could feel the desire start to almost like necrotize inside of myself. I could feel it starting to die. And I picked the phone back up and I said, no, 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 no. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I want to do it. The company pressured customers to buy classes and to even take on debt to buy classes. The company used sex to get sales and they did this in several different ways. You know, we have people who talk about how they were as salespeople instructed to own with or have sex with somebody who was then called up to, um, you know, buy a course. Partway through the year, Michal met somebody in One Taste. They got married. They got married at a One Taste retreat. And all of a sudden, she and her husband, they just had sort of gotten swept up in this whirlwind of the One Taste life. She was in around $20,000 in debt. She and her husband together had spent about $150,000, that's their estimate. Eventually, soon after they got married, Michal kind of reached a breaking point for a variety of reasons. She was feeling really stressed. Someone that she worked with, who was like her closest friend in one taste, left. And over time, she and her husband decided, like, we need to leave. Leaving one taste is this very lonely thing because once you leave the group, um, people inside the group are told that um, to never talk to you. Um, people sometimes refer to people who had left the group as dead. Um, and so it can feel very lonely because you have left this group that was, you know, your friends, um, often the people you lived with, the people you worked with, and you often break from them very suddenly. And then you don't really have anywhere to go. And the people out here think that the group that you just came from is super strange and they don't understand. There are a series of allegations in the story, and One Taste had different responses to each of them. So they say that they never um, required anybody to have sex with each other in the work context. Generally, the company says they never used sex for sales um, and that this is not something that they taught. Many people who had past experiences with One Taste said that they felt pressured to 
take on debt to buy courses. And the company said, we took money from people that we shouldn't have and that we've changed our policies since. I saw parallels between the way that One Taste ran and the way that some startups run, which is like, you really want to be part of a tightly knit group that is charging toward like a very unique solution that has a lot of meaning. That's what drove people to become super involved in One Taste. That's part of what drives people to um, work crazy hours for very little money for you know the chance at equity at like some company that you think is going to change the world. And for many of the people I talked to after the story ran, they were grateful that this was something that was finally being told. And their reactions to seeing their personal and confusing and weird and isolating story told in a major magazine um, was really heartening to me um, and was really meaningful to them.